From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador, I am Estefania Bravo. This is From the South. U.S. President Donald Trump is set to declare a national emergency at the southern border with Mexico to fund his wall. Trump is expected to sign Congress's budget to avoid another government shutdown by declaring a national emergency. He will bypass Congress to build his long-promised wall. For her part, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has threatened filing a legal challenge if Trump goes through with his plan. This news comes after Democrats in Congress agreed to a deal with President Donald Trump over the wall. The deal is an attempt to avoid a government shutdown before Friday's deadline. Democrats agreed to give Trump $1.37 billion to build 55 miles of barriers. Migrant rights groups say that in supporting the deal, Democrats are simply reinforcing Trump's policies. And more violent clashes have been reported between protesters and the police in Haiti's capital, Port-au-Prince. At least seven people have died since the wave of protests began last Thursday, demanding the resignation of President Jovenel Moïse. Protesters accuse the president of breaking his promises and increasing poverty in the country. Our correspondent in Port-au-Prince, Pablo Perez, has more. Well, it's been seven days of uh, protests uh, here in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, and well, uh, this is the, the the place known as Delmar, the neighborhood Delmar. Just behind me, there was a barricade yesterday, sustained by people, people that is, uh, of of these neighborhoods. That is, well, it's angry at the government because of the rise of the prices in general, and particularly about the price of the fuel that has, uh, has uh, registered uh, an increment of over 50% on their price. And right now, we can see how this gas station is closed, as well as, well, for many, for many days, uh, supermarkets, convenience stores, and other kinds of uh, business were closed too for fear of the, of, 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 of the rioters or protests that were being taken on the street against the government of Jovenel Moïse that, well, has not issued a statement yet about, well, either this uh, inflation process or the death toll of this uh, so-called uh, popular manifestation. Well, this is uh, the seventh day of protest and now things uh, seem to have uh, calm down a little we can see that people is uh, may the, the small businesses are open to the trade to the public and we know that there is also water supply and gas butane gas for cooking something that was that is very relevant for the people that was Pablo Perez from Port-au-Prince. The Venezuelan foreign minister held a press conference at the UN where he condemned the U.S. government for waging an economic blockade against Venezuela while also pretending to provide aid. The cost of this blockade is over $30 billion. And they are sending this so-called humanitarian aid for $20 million. So what is this? I'm choking you, I'm killing you, and then I'm giving you a cookie. So that's a show. And they have said it openly. They have said it's in order to um, prove the loyalty of the military in Venezuela. The loyalty of our armed forces has already been proved. The momentum of the coup that the government of the United States was promoting is over. It didn't happen. You have to rethink your strategy because Venezuela is a sovereign country. The foreign minister also read a joint declaration made with a group of nations that are asking for a peaceful solution in the country. We share the same interests and we will work to defend the following principles. One, respect for the principle of rights and self-determination of the peoples. 
point 42 of the UN Charter. Second, the sovereignty of each state. Number three, to promote peaceful solutions to international conflicts so as never to put in danger peace and security. Number four, to abstain from the use of force against any member state. Article 4.2 of the UN Charter. Five, respect for the territorial integrity and political independence of all member states and non-interference in the domestic affairs of member states. Point seven of the UN Charter. We think that these principles are being threatened and the peace of our states is being put in danger and uh, we all have the right to live without the threat of the use of force or the, or the imposition of unilateral coercive measures. In the coming days, we will increase aware, take actions to increase general awareness of these principles and the situation of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. We call on the United States government to join this defense of international principles for peaceful coexistence among humanity. Venezuela's Prosecutor General Tarek William Saab has said his office has opened an investigation into those who have been illegally named heads of oil company Citco and foreign ambassadors by the opposition lawmaker Juan Guaido. We have opened an investigation into the citizens who were illegally and unconstitutionally named chief executives of PDVSA and CITGO, and also against some citizens named as ambassadors in an illegal and unconstitutional move by someone who is an usurper of power. And Venezuela's armed forces are deployed along the border with Colombia, performing military exercises to protect the nation against foreign threats. Madeline Garcia has more in this report. Every corner of the border with Colombia has been reinforced by the military. This in response to threats of military intervention from the U.S. and its Colombian allies. We are constantly patrolling here. There are 21 brigades. This is sacred land. This is the entrance to South America. And in this time of independence, we had to make a camp under military claims by the geographical location that we live in. And we also have natural resources. We have been blessed by God. The troops are deployed. The military exercise Bicentenario of Angostura 2019 is safeguarding the border from war. We are approaching the border, carrying out the exercises ordered by our constitutional president of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela and the commander-in-chief of the Bolivarian Armed Forces. Our country is being threatened and our commander-in-chief ordered these exercises to strengthen our preparation in the interests of the nation. They are preparing for war, but also to defend peace. La frontera es muy amplia. The border is very wide. Behind us is Colombia. We are pretty close. When the river is dry, we are just one step away. It's easy to come and go. Venezuela is alert. They are highly vigilant to stop any chances of foreign intervention. That will be the worst threat. The military intervention that we will face in a conflict like this can't end anywhere. We're asking for Venezuela's sovereignty to be respect, just like every country. Every government demands respect for their sovereignty and to solve their issues in a peaceful way under the self-determination principle of the people. We hope that all of this ends in a dialogue like the president has asked, a sincere dialogue with an open agenda with all the incidents with our imperialist influence and that allow us to solve the crisis that the Venezuela is in. The armed forces join the people in calls for peace. Meanwhile, Cuba's government has denounced U.S. deployment of special forces in parts of the Caribbean without consent. Cuba's Foreign Minister Bruno Rodriguez says this is part of the preparation for a potential military intervention in Venezuela. The island is calling on the international community to join forces and stop any kind of interference. 
Eight progressive political parties from five Latin American countries have rejected the U.S. attempts at intervention in Venezuela. In a shared statement, progressive parties from Chile, Ecuador, Peru, Brazil, and Colombia called for dialogue and asked for peace in the region. They also criticized the Lima Group, saying it ignores the people's right for self-determination. The Russian government is also warning about U.S. plans to intervene in Venezuela. A provocation, including with victims, is being prepared under the gaze of a humanitarian convoy, and this is needed as a pretext for the use of force from the outside. This should all be clearly understood. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us. Welcome back. The Colombian government continues to evade its commitment to the peace agreement made with the FARC back in 2016. For example, President Ivan Duque is yet to sign a law that would allow the agreement to be ratified. Let's find out more. The Congress Peace Commission has asked President Ivan Duque to stop postponing signing a statutory law for the Special Jurisdiction for Peace that would allow the peace agreements to be implemented by law. Duque's government has failed at showing any sign of commitment with peace in Colombia, and yet he goes abroad and preaches about peace. But we have discovered he is not likely to sign the statutory law. It's preparing to object to it, but they haven't said anything yet. This law was approved last year here in Congress and was then also approved by the Constitutional Court, but Mr. Duque is unwilling to sign it. Senator Roy Barreras thinks that everyone who has advised the president to not sign the law is in the wrong. However, the Special Jurisdiction for Peace continues its work. The president cannot object to decisions made by the Constitutional Court. That would be catastrophic. If this law were to be objected by the president, it would actually hurt the Special Jurisdiction for Peace. It would remain in limbo and would then need to find a way to fulfill the tasks that the statutory law would have done. As the government and allies continue attacking the Special Jurisdiction for Peace week after week, international observers all agree that the solution to bring an end to the armed conflict is by implementing the peace agreements. What's fundamental is to focus on peace and on transitional justice. The Special Jurisdiction for Peace is key in order to help Colombia attain sustainable peace. For analysts and some politicians, the government is using everything at its disposal to hamper the peace agreement. Duque's refusal to sign the statutory law is just the latest. Despite these internal problems, Duque continues to focus all of his efforts on attacking the Venezuelan government of President Nicolás Maduro. One of the most wanted drug traffickers in the world has been arrested in Bolivia. A joint operation between Argentinian and local intelligence agencies led to the arrest of José Miguel Farfán. He entered Bolivia four years ago under a false identity. He's also accused of homicide and bribery. The case is so significant that this person is among the six most wanted in Argentina and a reward of 500,000 Argentine pesos was being offered to anyone who knew of the whereabouts of Mr. Farfán, given his status as a dangerous man. The UN Commission Against Impunity has resumed its operation in Guatemala. This comes after President Jimmy Morales ousted the Anti-Corruption Commission in January. Staff acknowledges it was a risky decision because there is a lack of protection due to the government's decision. But the commission will now resume monitoring judicial proceedings. Groups representing victims of the El Mosote massacre say more exhumations are expected to happen soon as experts continue to investigate its impact nearly four decades later. More on that in this report. The human rights organizations representing the victims of the El Mosote massacre have announced that new exhumations are expected to take place. The experts also say that the investigators in charge of the case will be responsible for researching how the massacre impacted the social and economic organization of the community. 
This massacre has been investigated for several years, since the 90s. During this time, more than 350 bodies have been found. Most of them have been identified. The new exhumations will be carried out in an area where a family of seven was buried, five of them minors. This shows how the massacre was systematically coordinated by the military to target civilians. Forensic experts have found these attacks targeted mainly minors. One representative from the organization representing the victims of El Mozote explained how the investigators were chosen and spoke about life in the area of El Mozote. Both the defendants and the accused in this process presented their choice of investigators. Some were accepted, some were not. Most of the experts presented by the accused were not accepted because they could protect their interests. The ones that were presented were almost all accepted. Among them are two anthropology experts who are experts on the life of the El Mozote community at the time of the massacre. On January 29th, two campesinos found bones while working the land. These human remains are thought to belong to Maria de la Paz Pereira, who was executed by the Salvadorian military, along her husband and five children. The massacre was carried out on December 10th, 1981, during a military action known as Operation Rescue and it was supported by several military units. Several witnesses have said that during the attack on El Mozote, every member of the community was arrested, including children. Jamaica is on the path to economic independence with recovery exceeding budget targets. Governor General Sir Patrick Allen delivered the news during his traditional throne speech at the ceremonial opening of parliament. Jamaica is on a path to economic independence. In that regard, international partners have commended Jamaica's performance. And the agency also upgraded the country's policies and programs that enable a stable macroeconomic environment. Cabinet also approved the establishment of an independent fiscal council for Jamaica. Jamaica's Governor General also says the island will play its role in ensuring that Brexit negotiations are successfully concluded, so as to maintain the country's strong partnership with the EU. Even as the United Kingdom prepares to exit the European Union in the coming weeks, the government has been ardently engaged with the rest of CAR Forum in working towards the conclusion of an economic partnership agreement with the UK that mirrors the acqui of the current agreement with the EU, preserving preferential terms for trade in goods and in services. The police service in Trinidad and Tobago has been put on red alert following a series of murders and gang-related activities. Officers have already begun carrying out raids in crime hotspots across the country. Police Commissioner Gary Griffith says he raised law enforcement's response to the highest level in a bid to return law and order. Now move from amber to red. This, is, this must not be seen in any way for the public to be fearful. Um, what, it is, uh, what we are doing is, is stepping up what, what, we are, what is required to ensure that you are safe and secure. So th there's a concept of operations that is nationwide. And whilst that, um, that alert state remains, we believe that there may be a perceived threat. And the perceived threat has nothing to do with The only thing it has to do is based on one or two specific individuals. I refer to them as punks. Thieves, parasites, cockroaches have continued to try to destabilize our country and to, prov and to prevent our citizens from having a safe and secure society. They, we will continue at this, at this level until we peg them back and let them know exactly that no gang in any part of this country, no turf, no street, no community belongs to them. That gives them the authority that they can put hits on persons. The National Union of Mine Workers of South Africa has said it will challenge plans by the country's largest coal producer to retrench over 6,000 workers. Sibangi Gold Mining announced that it will soon embark on a restructuring exercise, which will, among other things, include cutting thousands of jobs. The unions have, however, vowed to oppose any measures that will lead to job losses. We are worried that it comes to us through the media that Sibangi is intending to retrench plus minus 5,000 people. However, it's our duty to fight against retrenchments. Should we be given the official notice that they intend to retrench people, we will sit around the table and tell them why it is not right to retrench these people. 
And after more than one week, seven bodies have been retrieved from the Gloria coal mine in Middleburg, east of South Africa's capital. 22 people are believed to have gone down the mine shaft before a massive gas explosion occurred underground. Several people had entered the unused mine on February 6th to steal copper wires that supply electricity and for lighting and ventilation. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us. Welcome back. The lead defendant in the trial of 12 Catalan independence leaders has refused to answer questions in court, calling himself a political prisoner. In order for the interrogation to proceed as smoothly as possible, I will not renounce my democratic convictions and I understand that the prosecution will not stop prosecuting me for them. So I think I am unable to defend myself in the sense that I'm convinced that I'm accused for my ideas and not for the facts that are alleged against me, and therefore that I'm in a political trial. And therefore, as an elected representative and in relation to what I owe my constituents, I will not answer the prosecution's questions. Former regional vice president Oriol Junqueras faces 25 years behind bars if convicted of rebellion for pushing an independence referendum in October 2017. The referendum was brutally suppressed by the Spanish police. It was followed by a declaration of independence, which sparked Spain's world's political crisis in decades. The trial is expected to last three months. And now let's take a look at other stories from around the world. Russia's miracle baby Ivan Fakin has been discharged from hospital after six weeks of treatment. One-year-old Ivan came to the world's attention when he was rescued from under the rubble of a collapsed residential building in freezing temperatures on the 1st of January. The family have been given a new apartment by the government where Ivan will celebrate his first birthday on Saturday. Bania was treated by the whole country. It was the teamwork of rescuers, clinic staff, consultant physicians, and everyone else. But only Bania, this human, is the biggest hero. It's such a joy to see him in this condition. 12-year-old Fatima Koba is displaced by the war in Yemen. She was living under a tree and weighed only 10 kg when she was brought into a malnutrition clinic. Fatima has highlighted the plight of millions who are on the brink of famine, according to the United Nations. Dr. Makia al-Aslami, who is treating her, says she's expecting more malnourished people to come through her door. This month alone, she's treating 40 pregnant malnourished women. Fatima says her family were forced to flee when the Saudi-led bombardment started in 2015. A British teenager who travelled to Syria to marry an Islamic State militant now says she wants to return to the UK. Pregnant Shamima Begum told the Times newspaper how she became the bride of a Dutch IS fighter 10 days after her arrival in Raqqa, the capital of the self-proclaimed caliphate. Begum says she fled Syria two weeks ago to keep her unborn child safe after losing two children to illness. In conservative Afghanistan, Valentine's Day has become increasingly popular. Fresh red roses and gifts are openly for sale in shops in the capital, Kabul. This in a traditional society that largely views those celebrations as a Western concept contrary to the Islamic religion. And before we end the show, don't forget to tune in on Telesur this Sunday for the second episode of our new documentary series, After War. The series recounts the impact that the U.S. interventions have had in at least 12 countries across the world. Y cuando salimos afuera, la escena era dantesca. Un infierno. Habían cadáveres. Las llamas de los caserones de madera. 
And with that, we've come to the end of this news brief. These and other stories, as always, find them on our website at telesorenglish.net. And also join us on social media. We are on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. For Telesor English, I am Estefania Bravo. Thank you for watching.